Well, welcome everybody and thanks for joining us today. This event is hosted by MOLA, an association of music performance librarians. And this session is the first live event as part of our virtual conference, which runs through June 15th. We invite all of our viewers and members to go to our website for more information on upcoming sessions and resources. The conference registration is available to anybody. It's $25 and uh, gives you access to all of the sessions that are planned throughout the coming month, as well as uh, recordings of all of the sessions through the end of June. So it's a great deal. The website uh, uh, mola-inc.org is open to the public and you can also follow hashtag virtual MOLA 2021 on our social media channels for the latest information. We're pleased to present this session today in collaboration with Scoring Notes Live. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our presenters today. Thank you, Amy. And thanks to you and everyone uh, at MOLA for, for all that you do, really. It's, it's usually the case that the performance librarian is responsible not for just the last mile, but literally the last inch before the music gets in the hands of the performer making sure that the right music gets to the right person in the right place at the right time, I think as Nicole Jordan told us uh, on one of our earlier podcast episodes. So we know how important librarians are and it's been such a pleasure working with the entire MOLA community and being a part of these conferences really for many years now. So thank you uh, everyone on this presentation and Amy and everyone at MOLA. So for the benefit of everyone just tuning in, welcome to Scoring Notes Live, a special presentation of our Scoring Notes podcast. I'm Philip Rothman, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, David McDonald. David, it's nice to see you and to be seen. It is really exciting. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous with all of the people watching live. Normally, we can make mistakes and edit them out later, but you know, <laughs> you'll have to pretend that we edited them out. That's true. And we will have that opportunity. We should say that if you aren't watching this live, or even if you are, and you'd like to catch it again in your earbuds when you're going for a run or out for a walk, we will be putting this in the regular scoring notes feed at the conclusion of this week. And we will edit it up and, you know, maybe slice out all those curse words that we're prone to say during our taping uh, when we use music notation software. No. Uh, but we <laughs> we will definitely have this in the feed uh, at the end of the week for everybody to enjoy. So before we dive in today's discussion, and we are really looking forward to this one, we would like to we would like to thank our sponsor of today's presentation and podcast, Music, for supporting us. Music has a special message that they would like to present to you, and we are very happy to share that now. Great, thank you, Nuzik. So David, today's discussion is called comparing the major music notation software applications. And you know we cover lots of products here on Scoring Notes, but I think it's fair to say that a solid majority of our coverage is about one of the four programs that we'll be talking about today. And those of course are MuseScore, Finale, Sibelius, and Dorico, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and, and I think that is uh, probably the the set of applications which most of our listeners are the most familiar. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, look, there's good reason for that. I mean, if you are producing music with music notation software at the level at which it needs to be in order to put it in the hands of one of our fine MOLA colleagues, and it looks like there are quite a few on this call, so that's really great you know, you will be using one of these programs. And of course, that's not to say that there aren't 
other programs out there, you know, uh, and we we definitely talk about related technology, as we like to say on the intro to the podcast. We do say that all the time. But today, I think, David, so that our 75 minute session doesn't turn into like a 75 hour one, we're going to focus on comparing the pros and cons. And I'd say mostly pros of those four products and hopefully with an angle on things that a performance librarian might want to know. Yeah. And, and I think that's, I think the, the best reason for us in this particular session to focus on these, because I think they are the, the ones that will be of the greatest use specifically to music librarians. There are a lot of applications that we talk about for preparing uh, music and that are involved in the process. But I think these are kind of at the core for the, for most professionals in the field. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And we should also say that in addition to this session today for all of the professional librarians and other uh, guests that are joining the session, the MOLA conference schedule includes dedicated sessions on each of these four products. So I'll be leading the Sibelius one, our colleague, Jason Lafredo, I actually see him on the call. So hi, Jason. Uh, he is of Conquering Finale fame, and he has a great website called Conquering Finale, and we feature that on Scoring Notes. He'll be heading up the finale session. Uh, Mark Sabatella and Peter Jonas will be talking about MuseScore. And Joshua Ludi and Mark Fabulich are doing a Dorico session, and they're doing a roundtable as well. So lots of coverage on each of these specific products. And so today is going to be more of a general conversation comparing each of these in turn, and then hopefully we'll leave about an hour for, for Q&A. And I think probably the best way to do this is you can certainly save up your questions at that time. We'll, we'll leave that time uh, for later. Uh, if you, you know, really have a burning question, you can put it in the chat. We'll probably still leave it for later. Uh, Amy will help us manage those, but keep in mind that this is being recorded, as we said at the outset, for the podcast. And so it would be really great if you aren't too shy, if you're willing to raise your hand and actually get on audio uh, asking a question. I think that'll be a lot of fun, as opposed to just kind of, you know, robotly reading the chat messages. So uh, I think that's how it will go. And so let's just dive in, David. Um, you know, when you and I started talking about this, we contemplated the order of the presentation. And I think pretty quickly we realized that MuseScore should be separated from the other three. And so, you know, should either go at the end or we decided to lead with it. Uh, and that's what the first one we're going to cover. Can, so can you actually tell us why this one is kind of not like the others? So, yeah, I think that's a, a really good starting point here. So yeah. the, the other three are commercial applications. They cost a lot of money. They're made by professionals. And well, actually, that's not fair because MuseScore is also made by professionals. That's but right. MuseScore is a free open source application. Um, so there are a lot of great benefits to that. Free is, is probably the biggest. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, people see something that is free and assume that it is less capable than um, something that costs money. And I think for a lot of uses, MuseScore may be the best option because a lot of it will, it will cover most of the, the, the most common use cases for most people that are doing music notation. Um, those of you that are, are, uh, not familiar with, with, um, the podcast may not know. I am a university music theory and music composition professor. And so I see a lot of young students who are working with MuseScore on a regular basis. And so I see a lot of work in MuseScore. I think one thing to note is that if we were doing this session two or three years ago, we might not have included MuseScore because mm -hmm. it might not have um, been as capable as it would need to be to do even basic professional level work. And that is no longer the case. Um, I don't know, Philip, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's a fair characterization, actually. And I mentioned at the outset that I've been working with MOLA and doing presentations of this nature for quite some time uh, at the MOLA conferences. And I have talked about MuseScore and in addition to the other products as well. And yeah, it is kind of the one that has a really different trajectory than the others. And if, 
if you'll forgive us, uh, those of you that are watching and listening, I think it's actually important to actually have a very, very brief digression into the history behind MuseScore. And, and you'll see, I think, why it's important. Um, and we'll try to be as brief as possible because I think you know there's a lot of corporate stuff behind it, but it does affect the way the product actually works. And long story short, MuseScore, as David mentioned, is free. It is still free. It was free. It was developed as a free product, as an open source application. And what does that mean? That means that unlike the other software where the code base is kind of behind a, uh, you know, it's, it's hidden from view. You can't inspect it. You can't contribute to it. And it is under lock and key, so to speak. The code base for MuseScore is open to anyone. It's open to anyone to inspect, to contribute to. And that's how it was started. It was started by uh, basically uh, somebody named Werner Schreer. And then uh, Thomas Bonte and Nicholas Fromont got involved. And then there were some other people. And long story short, for the better part of a decade or so, it was this free product that was contributed to by the community. And there was a process by which that happened. But then what happened is that the product, uh, MuseScore, it started to become unsustainable kind of long-term. They did have a kind of a commercial offshoot where you could download uh, content. People could upload things to you know, share their scores. And it was kind of a dubious legality, which was another issue uh, that has all been since obviously rectified. And, and how that got rectified was that a company uh, called Ultimate Guitar at the time, and it still is ultimateguitar.com. And they are, if you're not familiar with this, this is a site that does music tabs, like guitar tabs, and there's millions of users, very, very popular. They saw an opportunity to basically acquire MuseScore and acquire, uh, you know, that infrastructure. And that happened a few years ago. And then just in the past few weeks, really, what happened was that company kind of rebranded itself as something called Muse Group. And if you haven't followed the news, they actually recently acquired Audacity. If you're familiar with that, that is also a free and open source product. It is a audio edit. Uh, it's an audio editing application. And then perhaps more of more interest to people on this call, they also acquired StaffPad. And you may know StaffPad, I presented about it at the MOLA conferences. StaffPad is a pen and touch tablet-based music composition app. And we've all seen the demonstrations where you write something on the pad, you write something on the iPad and it instantly converts it into music notation. It has a robust and bespoke, we would say, audio engine capability, playback capability. And it is a it is very much not free and not open source. And so it's interesting. These are all now part of one company, MuseScore, Audacity, StaffPad, something called the Muse Group. And I think, you know, as you said, David, and I don't think it was a, a slip. I mean, I think the it the operation has become professionalized in the past few years. They have really some sophisticated people working on the product and I think almost when we talk about MuseScore, if you pardon that backstory that I just gave you, because it is important, we almost have to think about what MuseScore was and maybe still is at this very moment in time and what we anticipate it is going to be. Would you say that that's a fair way of describing it maybe? Yes, I, I would say that this is an application that, like I said, just a few years ago, probably didn't belong in this conversation, but I think it absolutely does today. And of the four applications that we're going to be talking about today, I think it's one that has among the brighter futures ahead of it because of the the energy that is going into its rapid development. I think this is perhaps the, the best um, feature of the application right now is that it is going through a very rapid set of development cycles right now. Even the most recent version of it, which doesn't, it went from 3.5 to 3.6, which doesn't sound like a big update, but there were actually some really significant changes there. In the last year or so, the team has brought on more um, expertise in music engraving. I think one of the things that, that you or I would have, would have identified about this application not too long ago was that it did some kind of weird things with the, the, the music symbols and the spacing yeah. of those music symbols and the relative sizes of those music symbols were all kind of funky. And it, we, when you looked at it, even if you didn't know exactly 
how to describe what was weird about it, you probably would have been able to see that it wasn't the same quality of work that you would get out of one of the other commercial music applications. And I think that is becoming less the case with every new update. So the most recent update includes a completely new range of symbols and, and fonts that I think look really, really nice. They're, they've put a lot of care into the the way things are, are spaced and laid out on the page. And this is now a, a completely viable option for a lot of the work that people do. Um, I think the 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 some of the best features of it are that in addition to those regular updates, because it's free, it's really easy to share work with someone. You can send someone um, a MuseScore file, and even if they don't currently have MuseScore on their computer, they can put MuseScore on their computer for no cost, which is a pretty uh, a pretty powerful tool. Um, and I would say really the 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 biggest downside that you might run into here is that there are a lot of kind of power features, a lot of kind of bulk processing kinds of features um, that we would see in some of the, the big three commercial applications are missing. But for a lot of small scale things, I think MuseScore is a really good option. Yeah, that's, I think, very accurate. And the free part really, we have to be honest, cannot be overestimated, I think, especially for some of these smaller scale projects for now, and perhaps larger scale projects in the future. I mean, you know, let's talk about our, our Mola crowd here. If you are needing to do a simple transposition, say, or an insert, or even maybe create a simple arrangement, something like that, you will get by just fine in MuseScore. It can do all those things and a lot more, to be fair. Um, and it is also relatively easy to understand. I mean, if you open that product up, you will kind of be able to get around pretty easily. I have to say, it is, I, it, you know, it, we could be forgiven for mistaking it for Sibelius in some ways, because in some key areas, it did borrow, maybe is the generous term, from the way Sibelius does things, basic things like entering notes and, and articulations and that sort of thing. There are a lot of differences as well, but everything is laid out there pretty clearly. At the end of the day, all these products, I mean, there's really only a handful of ways to get music into notation software, whether it's step time entry or playing it in with your MIDI keyboard or putting it in with your computer keyboard. They all do it more or less the same way. So it's not really so much of a knock there. It's just like, hey, you know, this idea was out there and this is how you use it. So, and, you know, the free part, like I was saying, you know, you may not be at your current orchestra forever, and maybe your current orchestra has a finale license, and then the next one is more of a Dorico shop, and the next one is a Sibelius. You know, the point is that, as, as uh, David said, you can download MuseScore and it will work anywhere. And it is the only one of the four products where its top tier is free. There is no other tier, you know, Sibelius, Dorico, they have light tiers, they have free tiers, but we're talking about T, T, I, E, R, you know, uh, different levels of product. But MuseScore, the full product is free. And with MuseScore 4 coming down the pike, we anticipate that that will look potentially a lot different than it does uh, today. And it's maybe a little too early to say or even recommend fully that, you know, you, you go with that because I think there are some downsides, as, as David said. Um, one of those actually, it is also not to be, uh, overstated is that, you know, as many of you know, I'm a professional music preparer. I've been doing this for, uh, quite a while now, a couple of decades, uh, at least. And, um, I can only recall one project that I received that was done in MuseScore. And we're talking out of hundreds, you know, hundreds or even thousands of projects, really, that somebody has sent me new score files. Everything else has been Finale, Sibelius, and, you know, even now a few Dorico projects. So, you know, talking about that professional aspect, MuseScore is very, very much focused on that student base, you know, that amateur or maybe, you know, users that aren't using the full capacity of it. But the question is, and I think it's an open question, you talk about your students, David, a lot of them are using MuseScore. When they become professional, many of them will become professional musicians, some of them anyway. We can hope. 
We can hope. Yeah, we don't want too many of them, of course, because we actually want some people actually going to the concerts as opposed to, you know, performing in them. <laughs> but, um, but no, I mean, look, in all seriousness, we hope that uh, some of them will, will thrive and, and under your tutelage, I'm sure they will. Uh, and so the issue is, will they switch to something else, one of the more quote unquote professional apps, or will MuseScore continue, continue to evolve and grow with them and grow up with them so that they don't switch and they stay on MuseScore remains to be seen. I think it's exciting times, but that's- Well, and you consider yeah. that the, the competition, we keep coming back to the price, but I think that's really the key benefit here is $600 is a lot of dollars for the other applications. And, you know, in, in a lot of uses, I'm, I'm not sure that, that, that the other, the commercial applications are necessarily $600 better for every possible use case. Um, and, right. and what I usually tell people is that if, if you're considering one of those, um, lower tiers of the other applications is that, uh, those lower tiers are not as good as free Muse score. The, right. the limitations you will definitely run into if you go with the, the, you know, the lighter versions of Dorico or Sibelius or Finale, you're, you're going to get something that is not as good as the free MuseScore application. Yeah, and what David is talking about there is, say, Dorico Elements or uh, Sibelius. Sibelius. We had this discussion. We'll come back to that in a bit. Previous podcast. So the the pro level of Sibelius is called Sibelius Ultimate. The mid tier is actually just called Sibelius. Don't get me started. But you know those are limited in terms of features, in terms of number of staves and all that. And so at, sooner or later, you will run into a limit, limitation where it's like, oh, I need to add that 17th staff for my chamber orchestra piece. And now that's not, you can't just like add a staff for $5 in, it's not like an add-on. It's either upgrade to that full tier at the full price or, you know, decide that you're only going to write for 16 instruments. So that is kind of where the tiered pricing model breaks down. But I will say, at least at this moment in time, those professional products, uh, and again, professional is probably not the right term, the commercial products, the paid products, at their full capacity do outstrip MuseScore in many, many ways. And I think it is worth getting into those as well. So you know, we can always come back to MuseScore in the chat, uh, in the Q&A later, but David, why don't we move on to Finale and talk about that one? Yeah, I so this is the of the four, the one that I have the least experience with. Um, but I so what I know about Finale is, and this is probably the most important feature of Finale, is the length of its existence. So it has a huge legacy and a huge install base, especially uh, among certain musical practices, right? There, there are there. We've we've talked about this on on the podcast before. How deeply entrenched, especially a lot of Broadway is in um, finale, and it's really important if you're working collaboratively with other people is the ability to pass files around in a native application format and not using some kind of interchange format like music xml or midi but maybe you could talk a little bit more philip about um the the kind of things that make finale such a powerful tool on its own not just because a lot of other people use it yeah no i, I would be happy to do that and i will say you know we talked about that 600 hundred dollar price tag uh, just a moment ago. And for some reason, all of the three commercial products have landed at that range, plus or minus $50, and have been for a long time, for whatever reason. However, there is almost always a way to get each of those products at a significantly cheaper price, whether you are cross-grading from another product or you have an existing license, like Finale. Like if you have any license, even if you used Finale, you bought it 20 years ago, and you want to upgrade to the current version, which as of this moment is 26 and will soon be 27, uh, version 27 that is, there have been 27 versions of Finale, you can get that upgrade for just $99. And so it is actually a, you know, significantly less than that $600 price tag. Also the academic, there are academic versions. If you're a student and you, even if you have not ever purchased any notation software, you can get Finale for just $99. And I know it sounds like an advertisement. We're not, that's not what this is so much. It's just information. Um, and that is not a cut down version of Finale. That is actually the same version with all the features as anyone else would have. So 
uh, there is a way in, you know, usually one way or another, and we won't go through each of those for the products, but definitely check those out uh, on your own. But yes, uh, as I mentioned, I've been doing this quite a while and I have been using Finale quite a while, actually since 1993. And I am very comfortable with it. It is a very, very powerful program. It's a very good program. I can open up files from that time, from the mid nineties, and I have, and they will open up in Finale version 26.4, whatever the latest version is. And yeah, maybe I'll have to change a few fonts or you know update a few settings, but by and large, like I can get working if the file was done correctly um, you know, at the outset. And that is really, I think, a testament to how well they have maintained the product over the years. Now, it has come at the expense of innovation, like Finale in many ways lags behind some of the other products in terms of not just features, but I would say also to be fair, like the user experience. It is still, it still has that feel in many ways of a product that was designed at that time. You know, if you've opened up Finale and you see all those tools, it kind of looks like Adobe, you know, one of the Adobe products from that time or Photoshop or something like that, all these tool-based products. And what that does is it gives you a lot of fine tune granular control. And that has always been kind of the selling point of Finale. Like, in fact, their tagline, do anything your way. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. It's create your way, I think it is what it is. And and really, like, they're, they are leaning into it. Like, you want to go and take that staccato marking on your note and drag it halfway across the screen? Go for it. You know, you want to take those beams on your 30-second notes and, you know, alter the thickness and the angle and all, each one of them individually? You want to do that? great, you can do it. You know, you want to go five by five dialogue boxes deep and adjust the shape designer and the, you know, individual expressions. So each of them, each one of them is a slightly different point size and font size and font style and all of that. Yeah. You know, you can do it in finale. And so if you are trying to obtain a certain look, like you're trying to match a look of a score, like maybe you have a project where uh, a library project where you are trying to match very precisely the fonts, the thickness of the stems, the stem weight, the bar line width, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. You can find a setting in Finale to do just about anything uh, and 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 do it do it well. And and like David said, uh, the other aspect of it is the fact that there are so many Finale files out there and so many people using it. You know, you mentioned musical theater, David. I, for a long time, I was working with the Symphonic Pops Consortium. Uh, many of you know out of, uh, you know, Jack Everly and Indianapolis Symphony uh, did that for a number of years. Those projects were almost always done in Finale. So there are a lot of Finale files that have a lot of information in them out there for those purposes. So it's very powerful. It's very customizable. And so, yeah, those would be some of the, certainly some of the pluses for using Finale to be sure. Another one that I that I think is is worth emphasizing is in part because of its longevity and its its large installed base. There are a lot of automation tools that are built around Finale and and a lot of there's there's a, a, a large plugin ecosystem for um, automating processes that you do a lot, and um, you know that's to it's, a certain it's... extent. I would say sorry to interrupt. I would you know there was. There was an there was finale was was one of the uh, it was really at the vanguard for many years. There aren't a lot of people developing plugins for finale in that way. There are other tools for finale that people are using, and I should say so. Right. I just want to make that distinction. Like people are developing, That's, yes, yeah, yeah. Like for instance, like the Lua scripting and some other things. So. Um, yeah, just to, you know, I'm sure somebody will raise their hand or something. No, 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 there's no, pl no, no plugins haven't been developed in a while, that sort of thing. But anyway. Yes. Yeah. So not, they're not literally plugins into the application, but tools that yeah. are built to work kind of hand in glove with the, with the application for sure. Yeah. Um, if, if you want plugins, stick around for, for, for our next, <laughs> uh, our next application that we're going to talk about. Um, right. and that, and that's of course Sibelius, which has, um, a, a, a large and growing, uh, plugin library, which is, I think probably one of its best features at the moment. Wouldn't you say Philip? I would. Yeah. And we will get to Sibelius in just a second. When we talk about plugins, of course, we're talking about little programs that run within the software 
and you know have it do a whole lot of things. There are a lot of there are a lot of them available for for Finale, uh, and so there are ways to automate the heck out of it. Finale script and all these other things. Um, and, and so, yeah, that is really, really, if you like getting into those details and want to spend a little bit of time and that I would say finale can do a lot of things really well. And the other thing, you know, we'll talk about music XML and many of you know what music XML is. Maybe you don't music XML is the interchange format, the open standard that allows music notation files from one product to talk to that of another, like you could save a finale file in music XML format, and then open that music XML file in Sibelius or Dorico or MuseScore. And so it's a lot easier than obviously redoing it from scratch. While all these applications use XML, music XML, the standard itself is technically and legally owned by Make Music, the company that owns Finale. And the governance of it and the development of it is under a um, open standards organization. So, uh, and that's the way it is licensed. However, you know, I think it's fair to say that because Michael Good, who was the inventor of Music XML and is still very much, uh, uh, you know, the primary driver of its development, he's a Make Music employee, he's a Make Music vice president. And so it stands to reason that if for no other reason than you maybe want to make sure that whatever you're outputting or importing from Music XML has the deepest and broadest support, it's probably likely that Finale will be the program that can do that. And, and the one thing I'll say before we move on is that like even if you are opening a Sibelius file and you want to move it to Dorico, say, you might actually take an intermediary step, step inter, you might actually take an intermediary step and open it up in Finale just to see what comes out and then export it because a lot of the ways that these programs deal with music XML, it sometimes strips away a lot of the information that it doesn't consider relevant. Actually, Dorico does this to a certain extent because it just wants you to go into its own engraving default. It, it has gotten more, it has gotten better in that regard. But Finale actually will really take that data and I think to probably the largest extent, try to retain as much of it as possible. And again, that's because of the tight integration between Finale and music XML. So that's another reason to have Finale, especially if you can get it for you know one of the prices that is not the, the rack rate, so to speak, to have that on your computer. I think that is, is a pretty good uh, value for that alone. So yeah, um, obviously we're just scratch, scratching the surface here, but yes, David, by all means, let's, let's move on to Sibelius and talk a little bit about um, uh, Sibelius. So Sibelius, I think, is of the applications that we're talking about, the only application that will be in the ballpark of Finale in terms of the size of its user base. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's useful or even um, possible to, to guess which of them has a larger installed base. I think it's just fair enough to say that they're both really big. Um, yeah. A lot of people are using these. That means it's going to be really easy for you to move files around between uh, or among collaborators. Like um, MuseGore, it gets regular updates. Those updates have actually, I think, I would say have have picked up in the last couple of years in the, the, the significance of those updates. Um, we talked about the plugins. There are a lot of not only those that come from the plugins, but that are built into the application. There are a lot of automation tools and workflows that you can use to make certain elements of larger projects run really smoothly. So you don't have to do um, as much detailed, repetitive work. There are some really great features around templates and and um, bringing in house styles between documents that it probably, I would say, has the most robust set of tools around that kind of workflow. Um, it has some really nice collaboration features that have been added over the last year or so. It works much, much more nicely with Music XML, which Philip was just talking about than um, it has in the past. It has started working much, much more nicely with MIDI data. So if you're working with musicians who are writing music into a digital audio workstation, which is super common for film scoring, um, that is uh, going to save a lot of time there. There's some really great features around annotating 
score documents and leaving comments the same way that you might in a PDF file if you use um, uh, PDF files for any of your work or if you're just passing Word documents back and forth and leaving comments that are like, like little sticky notes throughout the document. There's some really nice, useful tools around those. Um, and uh, so I, it, it, it is the one that is the closest to Finale in terms of how long it's been around and how rich its feature set is and how widely it is used. And I think the 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 powerful automation tools in the plugin library for things like proofreading, for selecting all of a certain kind of note or rest and doing an operation with them to, to make them bigger or smaller or um, flipped to a different side of the staff or any of these kinds of operations that you might want to do or you might need to do hundreds or thousands of times in a single score, those kinds of automations are um, really well supported by Sibelius. Wouldn't you say, Philip? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, again, when we're talking about automating the tools, and that is something if you are a regular listener to the Scoring Notes podcast, we really can't emphasize enough that anything you can do to save yourself time to stop doing the same repetitive task over and over and over and over again will definitely serve you well in the long term. And so what David is talking about here, let's kind of break that down because David, I think you went through Sorry, that was I was a little fast there. <laughs> that was well, that, that was a great list and I encourage everyone to take notes and if I was in your lecture course I'd be, you know, scribbling furiously. So I appreciate that uh, rundown. Uh, but definitely with the with the plugins uh, that is something that those are, you know, like we said, little programs that run within the software. And these are things, anything from like the most basic operation that, for instance, you want to swap two staves. You want to swap whatever is on your flute staff with whatever is on the violin staff. And you don't want to have to copy and cut and paste and paste to a scratch staff and all that. Believe it or not, actually, there's no stock way to do that in Sibelius without a plugin. Uh, but with a plugin, it's called Exchange Staff Contents. It's super easy. And by the way, in Finale, there's a plugin, the JW plugin called, uh, it has to do, in, it's in the polyphony tool called Swap. And it does really pretty much the same thing. That's like something I use all the time. And I'm actually, you know, I actually have to remind myself that's not included in Sibelius. But the thing is, it's extendable. And there are people that are writing these little tools, programs. Most of them are free to download. Uh, a few of them are paid. And you can just kind of run them and put them in your Sibelius uh, folder and they will run just like any other function. But my favorite, they're... I should say, are the yeah. proofreading plugin. Yes. Uh, where you will it will save you from telling the string player Arco and then eight measures later telling them Arco again. And they're wondering <laughs> where the pits that they missed in the middle was. Yep. This will say, hey, you've got two Arcos in a row. That's you should either get rid of the second one or you forgot something else in between. Um, so if if you've ever made that error, there's a plugin that will help you not make it as many times in the future. That's right. And it's called Check Pizzicados because I just ran it probably just a few hours ago, actually. <laughs> so uh, so it's that actually. And those are included with the software. They're in the proofreading section. And so there are things like check redundancies. Like if you set, again, like another example, if you have a bass clef and then another bass clef, like was there a treble clef in the middle that I missed? Was, you know, you have a 4-4 four, four bar and then another 4-4. Four, four. Was there a 3-4 in there that I somehow missed? Now, I do that uh, all the time. Yeah, I, well, part of that is because it's actually pretty easy to screw up in Sibelius. And so in a way, these tools are kind of, it's like, here, we're going to make it easy to mess this up, but then we'll make it easy to fit, to, to check for it and fix. So, you know, look, take that maybe with, with the make of that what you will. Um, but there are other things that can prove, it can really prove the heck out of your score and uh, the annotations and the comments, I have to say, these look on the surface, they look like child's tools. Like, oh, let me drop a sticky note in here, or let me, you know, put a little note in the score for, you know, Jimmy or something to look at the score later. But, uh, but actually, they are really, really useful. So let me give you an example, okay? Those of you know that I work on, um, you know, many projects. One of them is with the Aaron Copeland Fund for Music, and part of our uh, process in days that we were able to go to orchestras, and we will do so again very soon, uh, is that I would go to the rehearsal of a the first performance of a work before we actually released the new score, the newly engraved score out there in the world for publication. 
you know, one of the orchestras and I've worked with the Louisiana Philharmonic on this. I've worked with the, um, you know, the Hartford Symphony with uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra. A number of orchestras have agreed to play from these provisional sets of parts um, so that we kind of iron out any last mistakes or just get feedback from the players. Super helpful if, if you work for one of these orchestras and indeed uh, many of you do. Thank you, thank you. It, it's enormously helpful. So what I will do, I will have a desk that the orchestra will set up for me in the in the hall, and I'll have my Sibelius set up in there, my, my laptop and a couple of extra screens and so on. And I will have the, I won't be reading off of like a printed score. I will be reading off of my Sibelius file in real time. And I will just drop, anytime I hear something that maybe doesn't sound right or whatever, I will just drop a comment. There's a shortcut for it. I even have a, you know, on the stream deck, those of you, this little tool, gizmo that you can push a button and it'll just drop a sticky note right into the score and automatically it will say the name of the instrument it will say the bar and i can just type in oh sounds like it should be a b flat or you know whatever my comment is dorco actually has a similar feature i think sibelius is actually just intuitively a little bit better it looks a little more like what you'd expect it to look like on the screen but dorco has that feature as well uh, as of one of the more recent updates and then what you can do is you can actually export all of those comments into a pretty sophisticated table. Uh, you can bring it into a spreadsheet or whatever. And then I can go through, whether it's with the editor, whether it's the conductor, and just kind of say, hey, let's kind of go down the line. And was this, you know, should, how do we resolve that? I can't tell you if you've ever had to mark up, a, you know, you're going through a score and it's like you make some sort of weird notation in your score by in pen, and then you have to dog ear the page and then flip to it, you know, you know, this is so this, this, and I've done this for recording sessions as well. Same thing when I'm following along in a recording session, I'll just drop a note, a marker really in the score and use that feature. That is really helpful. I have to say, so there's that. And I would have to say also, David, and you know, correct me if, if you feel differently, but of all the software that we've talked about, Sibelius is the least tool-based software. And I would include Dorico actually being more like Finale in some, some respects than even though they share a, you know, a history, a DNA with Sibelius in terms of their developers. You know, Dorico, which we'll get to in just a moment, actually has this way of separating out the music. You can only do certain things in one mode and certain things in another, kind of like it's not, you know, it's not, 12 or 15 tools like Sibelius, uh, like uh, Finale is, but it's several tools. And Sibelius, if you just want to, you know, click a note and drag it, you want to click a mezzo forte marking and drag it or change it or whatever, it, there's kind of the least friction, I feel, in that regard to just getting your thoughts down and changing something that's in the score, clicking and dragging around the page. It just, it just does it. And that was the appeal when Sibelius really first became you know, known to a lot of people that were only using Finale. It was, it was revolutionary to them in many, many respects. Um, and I would have to say the one other thing that I would say is that if you have used Sibelius for a while and you haven't upgraded, or even if you have, but you maybe aren't familiar with some of the, the new workflows, as David said, they have been regularly updating the product. We haven't really seen maybe the, you know, the kind of whiz bang features that we used to see in terms of magnetic layout or dynamic parts, but it is regularly being improved. Certainly the importing of music XML and MIDI is, is pretty significant. And, you know, you'd be well served to, to get up to speed on some of those improvements. Cause I think they will uh, really help you out. Yeah. What I usually tell people about the tool situation in Sibelius, especially people that are coming from Finale or Finale users who are interested in something about Sibelius is that I, I kind of tell them that they, they, it's it's like they can imagine using Finale where all the tools are on all the time, which <laughs> can be really convenient, but it can also get you into trouble very quickly if you're if you're not paying attention as well. It's yeah. very easy to accidentally click a dynamic and drag it off into the nether regions of of the bassoon part. <laughs> yeah, or you know, for the procrastinator in all of us. You can write a few notes and then start tweaking it right away and being like, oh, maybe I should just tweak this slur a little bit, or maybe I should just move this dynamic a little bit out of the way. And it, it you can actually get distracted from your composing process. And that brings us to Dorico, where those two ways of working are very separate, separated. And uh, Dorico, of course, is the newest kid on the block. 
And it is one that, as we just said, really shares its DNA to a large extent with Sibelius in terms of the people that are working on it. And yeah, uh, David, I know that you actually use both Sibelius and Dorico. So uh, this would be a great time to maybe talk about how you see one versus the other. Yeah, and, and I think it's worth understanding a little bit about where Dorico comes from. You hinted at it a moment ago, but um, Dorico comes from the team that is responsible, largely the team that is responsible for Sibelius for many years. The, uh, Sibelius was purchased by Avid, and they kept the development team in uh, London for several years. And at some point, through some kind of corporate restructuring, they decided they did not want to maintain that office in London with those developers. And so they let all of them go, and the, the development team was offered to move to somewhere else where they were consolidating their offices. Most of them, for lots of obvious reasons, decided they did not want to leave uh, the UK. And so there was this this pool of very talented people who were very skilled at this very niche um, thing of, of developing music notation software. And uh, Steinberg, in uh, the the proprietor of applications like Cubase, which is a great digital audio workstation and other digital media applications decided that they wanted to enter this category. And so they hired up many of those people and set up a new development office in London and they let them go and work on this application without releasing anything for four years, which is kind of wild to think about, um, you know, paying the salaries of all of these highly skilled developers for four years without getting any return on that investment. And so we're currently in version three. Go and ahead. I will say, sorry to interrupt, but I will say in 2016 at the Helsinki conference, MOLA conference was where Dorico was publicly revealed for the first time. We knew, of course, that they were working on something, but we didn't know what it looked like really or what it was called. And that information was conveyed to the assembled audience in Helsinki, Finland in 2016. So there you go. So a, a, a proud history with the, the MOLA conference. Um, right. So uh, Dorico today is in version 3.5, which is, uh, I, th I think we're uh, right around four years past um, the initial launch of version one of Dorico. And because it is so much newer than the others, and because the development team had the experience of working on Sibelius for probably 20 years before um, starting on Dorico, they really took the opportunity to take everything that they learned from their experiences. This was their opportunity to rethink some of the fundamental assumptions that existed in Sibelius. Once you get 20 years into a software application like that, it's really hard to make certain low level changes. And so they got to make some of the new assumptions that they had maybe dreamed of making on Sibelius for the first time in Dorico. Um, and so because of that, I would say not only is this by far the newest of all the applications we're talking about, it is by far the most different from the others of all of the applications that we're talking about in the way that it expects people to work. Um, some of those features are really, really wonderful for large projects in particular. The way that Dorico deals with um, works that have discrete chunks. So if you're working on um, a musical or an opera where the number of different numbers that are all part of the same project or a multi-movement work or um, anything like that, a collection of, of things, it's very easy in Dorico to have these different discrete um, passages of music that Dorico calls flows that can all be part of the same document. Those flows can have different instruments in them, um, which is a really cool thing. You can have different versions of exactly the same thing. So you might have one version of the score that is set for um, like a miniature version for somebody to look at up close and then another version of the score that is laid out slightly differently on a large document for a conductor to look at. You might have a version of the 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 um, piano vocal score for an opera that is different from the large ensemble thing, and they can all be part of the same single Dorico document, which is really kind of um, remarkable and a new thing that is made possible by the fundamental assumptions that the team made about how this works. Yeah, um, and I'll interrupt you there, sorry, David, just for a second, because if you're accustomed to one of the other products, 
the way you would get at that point in the other products is by a combination of workarounds, essentially hiding empty staves, applying certain types of page breaks and blank pages in your score. And then of course, say if you want movement two to actually be movement one or vice versa, forget about it. Like that is a huge <laughs> pain in one of the other programs because you have to copy and paste. And Dorco is just like, oh, nope, just switch that flow from one box to the other and that's it. So if, when you think about it in that way, that's what David is talking about with, with the flows. It is unlike anything else. It, you know, In the other programs, everything is completely linear from beginning to end and it's just the way it is. Dorco has a different solution for that. And, and kind of along those lines, I think people that are new to Dorico, especially coming from other applications, might be surprised at um, what I would describe as how opinionated Dorico is. It has very strong opinions about what the music should look like and how you should use the application. And if you try to use the application in a way that it does not expect, it's not going to work out well for you. So if you're <laughs> if you're thinking about trying Dorico and you're coming from Finale or Sibelius or MuseScore, this is the hardest thing to do as a person who did this myself coming from using Sibelius for 20 years and then jumping into Dorico. Um, and it's impossible to do completely, but try as much as you can to start fresh and not assume that you should do things the way that you did them in another application. Things that don't require workaround or things that required workarounds in Finale or Sibelius may not require a workaround. And if you try to approach it from that same perspective in Dorico, it's it's going it's not gonna work out well for you or Dorico. Yeah, um, and I think this was ahead. this is this would actually be a good time to give an example of that because yes. and, and 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 I may have actually. You know, I'm sure if, if any of the Dorico uh, developers or fans might uh, take issue with what I said, comparing it to Finale with a tool-based thing, because what I was talking about is kind of a separation of workflow to a certain extent. But, you know, one example that you're talking about, you know, kind of leave your assumptions at the door. In Finale, in Sibelius, we talk about things that are lines, things that look like lines, they have a beginning and an end point. That can be a hairpin, that can be a slur, that can be some sort of arrow or something like that. All these things. Now, you know, what is a hairpin? It's a dynamic, you know, it's a way of expressing that the music goes from one dynamic to another. Okay. What is a mezzo forte, you know, an MF? That's also a dynamic. And an F is another dynamic. Okay. In Finale and Sibelius, those are two completely different, you know, concepts. You know, you have to imp go to the expression tool to input an MF, but then you have to go to the lines tool, the, sh the smart shape tool to input the hairpin. Now, you know, it's likely that really what you want to be doing is putting in the mezzo forte and then probably a crescendo and then put the F and then you have to switch back and forth between those tools. In Dorico, you're not switching between those tools at all. It is one concept, the dynamic. And Dor Dorico understands that those things mean the same thing. Like they understand, like if you write C-R-E-S-C -E in Dorico, and then you also decide, you know what? I actually want that to not say C-R-E-S-C, -E, but I want it to be a hairpin, like a crescendo hairpin. There's a toggle that says, oh, just, I know that that means, you know, crescendo. Dorico, I mean, uh, Sibelius and Finale, no concept, there's no concept of that because that crescendo is text and the hairpin is a line. So that's what we're talking about, about leaving your assumptions at the door with Dorico. And I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, David, no, that's but, great. Yeah, I think yeah. I think lines are a really good example because as you just pointed out, some lines like hairpins are dynamics, but other lines like trills are ornaments. And so yeah. Dorico will group the trill with a turn symbol because they're both ornaments. And yeah. in, in that regard, th this is one of the the things that you'll you'll find if you if you read the documentation or the user forums for Dorico or read scoring notes or listen to the scoring notes podcast is that Dorico really wants to think of music semantically that is to take the meaning of the symbol and then interpret what it should look like um so it really wants to know what a dynamic is and how that's different from uh a, an ornament and similarly, it w it wants to think of notes that are tied together as a single entity because that's what they mean to the performer. When yeah. you've got notes that are tied across the bar line, Dorico will think of that as one sound that happens to be represented by this collection of symbols as opposed to a single symbol. And that's, again, just an example of the sorts of things 
that will often trip up new new users who are coming with coming in with the assumptions that are completely reasonable uh, for people who have um, gotten into this using Sibelius or Finale or MuseScore. Yeah, one example actually, we interviewed we, you know Nicole Jordan from the Philadelphia Orchestra on the podcast. Great interview, by the way. If you're not familiar with our podcast and you want to go back and take a listen to that, it was she was actually the person that said you know she wants to get the right music in front of the right player at the right time and so on. And she talked about being a librarian, what that means. But she was talking about trying to do a harp part, uh, harp, you know, uh, you know, the instrument, uh, not a hard part, a harp part in finale, and was having, you know, struggling with it and then put it into into Dorico. And Dorico actually knew that that was a harp part and not just a grand staff with a harp instrument assigned to it. And there were certain functions specific to the harp, like pedal changes, like it knew actually, David, you were telling me a story recently, like when you were talking about proofreading, like yeah. Dorco actually colored a note incorrect and it knew because there was a pedal change that was missing. And yeah. yeah. And so, so it, I, I just yeah. did, I, I, I gave a, a like I said, I'm a, I'm a university music theory professor. I gave my final exams. I gave a first year music theory exam uh, just last week. And I had an example from a Sophia Dusik harp sonata and in this harp sonata that I entered into Dorico to have in, in, in the exam, it's mostly in one key, but there's a couple of notes later that, that, you know, are from another key and it colored them red. Now I know that the harp is perfectly capable of playing those notes, but the thing that it was telling me is that I hadn't indicated a pedal change to allow that F to become F sharp. And it's right. doing that for me. Now I can choose to ignore that. I can say, don't, don't worry about that. I trust the harp player to figure out the pedaling themselves, or I'm going to do something else, or this right. isn't really a harp part or whatever, but it will tell me that and can then kind of figure out what the, the, the pedal indication needs to be to show the player that at some point between here and here, they need to change from F to F sharp. Um, yeah. So those sorts of things, and this is kind of what I'm talking about and what the, the, the Dorico team means when they describe the semantic understanding of the music. The, the, the application understands the difference between an F next to an F sharp in a piano part and an F next to an F sharp in a harp part, because those are fundamentally different things for the performer musically. Right. Um, that's a, no, that's a great example. And I you know, look, I think in the MOLA uh, conference, there were, there are a couple of sessions and Joshua and Mark will surely be able to talk about those things more in depth and what, how they are used in the li library context. But David, you said, you know, again, thinking of it in a different manner, I will say that if you are accustomed, I know many librarians actually are accustomed to using not just music notation software, but maybe even have even a greater facility in some respects with programs like InDesign or Photoshop or some of these page layout uh, tools, InDesign, I suppose, more than Photoshop in this regard. But actually, Dorco has a lot of similarities. If you're accustomed with, you know, if you're accustomed to using those types of tools, you will feel right at home in Dorico in terms of laying out your pages, master pages and page layout, that sort of thing, because you can do things, you can talk about, you know, those flows. You can put those flows on any part of the page you like. You can put a little two bar excerpt on a page in a very design-like fashion. And it is real music. It's not just like, you know, copying and pasting a graphic and dragging it back in. So those are ways that I think Dorico is, is, really helpful in the librarian context. So I'll be curious for, for Mark and, and Joshua, what they have to say about that uh, aspect. One other thing before we take, you know, start opening it up to questions, and this is just kind of a little cool feature is that, you know, a lot of times if you're working in a new piece and you want to be able to make uh, notations, annotations, or write additional notes to yourself as a musician, uh, Dorico actually has this really cool feature. They call it Hollywood staves, but it is basically the concept of filling out the entire page. Like you would see like somebody copying out uh, a handwritten part on an old archives uh, sheet music, you know, blank uh, manuscript paper, and there's just blank staves at the end. And it's helpful if you want to make a little jot a note to yourself in music notation, you can actually do that in Dorico. You can actually, you don't have to end the music 
at the double uh, bar line, at the final bar, bar line. You can actually, there's a function that you can fill out the, the remaining pages of the staff and make it actually really easy to create blank manuscript paper, which is kind of cool. I want to point out one other very useful feature that I think will be of particular use to uh, our audience here today of, of music librarians, and that is the, the Dorico feature of slices, of graphic slices. So this is, I think, super useful for doing inserts. So yeah. any, uh, any piece of any document in Dorico, you can go into a certain mode and draw a little rectangle and export exactly that rectangle as an image. And you can pick the image format. It will be cropped to exactly the space that you drew the rectangle. And you can, of course, do things like this in other applications. And of course, you can always export and do screenshots and do all kinds of things with a PDF. But what's super cool about it's this feature- It's persistent. Yes, exactly what I was going to say. It's yeah. super cool about this feature in, in Dorico is that that rectangle that you created is saved to the document. So that wherever you drew that, that's still going to be there the next time you open the document. You can even name it. So you can say this is the insert for this player's part at this measure in this piece. You can say this is the... the um, the example that I'm going to use for a notation legend in the in the front matter or something like that, you can draw that little rectangle and it's always going to be exactly in that spot. So it's a it's a super useful feature, I think, for for anyone who's doing very um, small tweaky changes to an existing composition to be able to to to, to grab just a tiny piece and leave that um, that saved selection there for for editing and for for future reference. Yeah, well, that has a whole lot of applications in a variety of contexts, and it is a very, very cool feature. So, yeah, you know, look, we can be, uh, <laughs> I'm sure we could talk for many, many more hours, and we have in the past about these products. But look, we've got a lot of people on this uh, presentation, I see, and we, I haven't been keeping up with the chat, but I think maybe, uh, Amy, um, if you would be so kind as to open it up for questions, and I don't know the best way to call on people, if somebody wants to raise their hand or something. I saw, um, I saw Jason had a question. Jason Lafredo, who you mentioned earlier, had a question about MuseScore. Um, Jason, do you, uh, are, you, are you still around? Would you like to, to ask your question aloud for the benefit of audio in the future? Hello. Hey. Hey, hey. guys. Hi, Jason. I was actually just curious. I, you know, I haven't touched MuseScore at all yet, but I was curious if, if you guys think that um, eventually it will be a paid program. No, that's uh, governed by the license under which it's released. Mm, so interesting. The, yes, the the slightly longer version of of that answer is that the the source code is under uh, a, a GPL two, I think, version two license. But basically, it, it's anybody can get access to the source code basically forever in its current state um muse group would have to like basically get the permission of every single person who has ever contributed one character of the source code to muse score over the last however long it's existed um what i what i think is more likely is that you will start to see more uh things layered into the muse score experience that you might uh be charged for and this if you look at muse groups other um uh, adventures, this is, I think, the thing that you will see. So right now, MuseScore is free. The tool to make your scores are free. And what costs money is being able to upload and download to their servers, which they uh, you know, obviously have to pay to keep running. Um, the other thing that I think you'll probably see in the not too distant future, which Daniel Ray, who's the head of strategy for Muse Group, mentioned on a recent episode of, of the Scoring Notes podcast, um, is that we will likely see the um, the audio engine from StaffPad, which was recently brought into the Muse Group, show up in the uh, MuseScore product, which is a, mm. a an amazing way of rendering audio with very realistic sounds um, using sample libraries. That is, as as Philip mentioned earlier, kind of a bespoke audio engine for StaffPad. And um, so Daniel has has said that we should probably expect that to come to MuseScore. And I think probably what that means is you'll be able to buy audio samples that work uh, directly into MuseScore. And that will be right. another way for them to, to earn revenue. And I think we'll see similar things with Audacity. Um, yeah. But basically, MuseScore itself, the tool, the core tool, I think is probably always going to be free. And in a legal sense, 
will necessarily always be free and mm. they will find other things um, that are services. Basically anything that costs them money, they will pass along to you, but things that only cost them development time, they will continue to make free. I was going to say, because they're going to have a team of engineers and coders and everything, they're probably going to have to find some way to pay them to keep the, the program current and updated and add features and stuff like that. So, Well, exactly. and don't forget, there's also the MuseScore.com content you know, subscription right. service, which right, is right, another right. way to do it. So, yeah. So, look, that's a great question. Um, and we have a question actually from Chris in Victoria. Uh, if Chris, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask that question, I think it's a great one. Uh, sure thing. Yeah, I, I'm wondering which of these uh, softwares uh, best supports functions converting scans or PDFs to something that's edible by the software. Excellent question. And actually, we not too long ago did a deep dive into this with our colleague John Hinchy, who reviewed four different scanning, or I should really say uh, more accurately, optical music recognition applications. And of course, we actually saw uh, our sponsor, Music, just announced via that video another one uh, that they will be rolling out uh, very soon. So we'll be very interested to see what that looks like as well. So it's really less about the music notation software and more about the software that is actually taking that information in the first place, whether it is something like scan score or photo score or smart score or play score. They all seem to have score in the names or music's new product. And then how they interpret that data, their own individual recognition engines, how they then you know, are able to get it into a format, basically music XML, uh, and then get it over into the notation software. A lot of them, what we have found is that whatever you can do in the scanning software, the OMR software itself first, before bringing it into the notation software will save a lot of time. And so I would definitely encourage if you're interested in this sort of thing, there's a huge blog post review on scoring notes, uh, comparing those four apps. Plus there's the podcast, which I believe is embedded in that article as well. So we did a deep dive on that. Again, props to our colleague, John Hinchy. And then really it's about then what the notation software does with that information. So uh, to piggyback on what Philip is saying, the the optical music recognition applications will look at the score and the thing that they will generally generate for you is music XML. And so the question then becomes, which of these applications do you like to work with music XML in? Um, and this is um, something that, that I think we've said that all of these applications tend to handle pretty well. Finale, of course, is um, from the, the, the same company that has you know managed the music xml project for for many years sibelius has added a lot of really powerful music xml import features over the last year or two and dorico i think does a really beautiful job of importing music xml as well in fact that's how that application started um is that it you know, before they built the user interface to enter music, they just wanted to make it render music really beautifully. And so they built it just based on bringing in music XML from outside. And so all of these applications will handle music XML um, in different ways. Yeah. And that's what you're yeah. going to get out of the OMR applications. Yeah. And not to put too fine, a, not to put too fine a point on it, but really you will be better off. I mean, some of these applications have light versions of the software of scanning software bundled like Sibelius has a light version of PhotoScore bundled with it. They're almost useless, really. You want to basically get one of these dedicated programs that we found that have the full set of features that is separate from the notation software and then use it that way. Uh, good. All right. It looks like we have a couple other questions. I guess this is kind of good to put it in the chat and then we'll, we'll call on you. So um, yeah, so I apologize if the name is not pronounced correct. Uh, Tar Taran, you have a question? Yes, hi. Um, I was just wondering if, to your knowledge, either of you, if there's like a geographical preference for notation software, sort of like how Finale is really common on Broadway. Like, have you noticed any trends from city to city or country to country? Is there like a Dorico commune floating around somewhere that I could join? <laughs> I, I personally, I, I don't think I know of anything like this. I think it's more a matter of who you're usually collaborating with, which may be geographically based and it may not be. Philip, do you have any, any thoughts on that? 
No, it used to be more so, I think, when the internet was just not as common and the way you would find that basically that people in the United States were using Finale and then in the UK, they were using Sibelius and all of that. But uh, no, I maybe, you know, someone might have a different opinion on that, but I have not seen that so much these days. Um, Avik, we have a question. Avik Shari. Hey, how's it going? Uh, Hi. Firstly, uh, love your podcast, just by the way. Thank um, you. So I, this is the first time I'm hearing about Dorico slices. I'm, I don't really use Dorico, so it's quite interesting. I just want to know, is it possible to then, you know, reformat the layout of uh, like a badly formatted part right in Dorico? And also on top of that, with you know other applications like Illustrator that we might use to create symbols and graphics, do you ever see like the notation software uh, creating their own in-the-box versions of them? So I, I can take these uh, as much as sure. I as I can. I think feel feel free to to jump in and correct me when I inevitably get something wrong. Um, if I'm understanding your question right, to reformat a part in Dorico, you really would need to have that entered into Dorico to be able to do much with it. Now, what you can do is import a graphic into Dorico. Um, I'm not sure if this is the, the, maybe the best workflow for something like this, but you could potentially import a graphic into Dorico as the page of the, uh, of the part that you're trying to reformat and then um, put an insert in on top of it there. I think you'd be better off using a dedicated graphics application for that and bringing your slice of the insert into that graphics application to do it like that. Yeah, one thing, maybe I'll just take your question and turn it around a little bit uh, more broadly speaking is that there are lots of ways of getting music in and out of these notation software products, not just Dorico, but any of them really. And depending on whether you are talking about a SVG or a PDF or a, you know, uh, just a, P, you know, a PNG and all of these acronyms mean different things and they do different things, but there is, uh, there are ways of exporting um, that from one software application to another. It just in brief, like if you were going to go into another uh, design application, you would want something what's called a, as a vector format. And that allows you to then take that. And that's usually either an SVG or even a, you know, a PDF. Um, and that would take, allow you to take that and manipulate the line thickness and, you know, that sort of thing at a very granular level, you could kind of break apart the component pieces of that. Whereas if you just wanted a, a graphic like a PNG or something like that uh, would be a more static snapshot. But what David is talking about the, with the slices is that, you know, you can have a list of those slices in your Dorico file and basically say, okay, bar two in the flute part is this thing. And then if that music changes, you don't have to then go and redraw the, the bounding box of that graphic. It will already be there. You can just re-export that slice into whatever you're using, you know, a web page, your Word document, what have you. And that's really where the power of the slices is, is helpful. It, you know, think about Sibelius or Finale. Those are all one-off operations, never to be remembered again. You, you know, you, you draw that bounding box of the graphic, you export it. And then if you need to do it in that same spot in your score again, you've got to do it again. And it may not be the exact same size, you know, you may be a pixel or two off and all that. So that is where the graphic slices really come into play. I will say also to uh, Avik had another question there about yeah. um, creating notation symbols in the application. And I will say that um, you're asking specifically about Dorico. So I'll answer with respect to Dorico that Dorico has a, a very robust symbol editor that will allow you to bring in symbols from any font that are installed on your computer, as well as you can import any SVG vector graphic like Philip was just talking about into a symbol editor and you can define where it where it should appear with respect to a note head you can make it a note head you could make a note head that is like literally a vector graphic of Mickey Mouse or something like that um, and put that into your your score so that every half note is Mickey Mouse or something like that um, and now don't do that you'll get sued but um, you should, uh, you have the, the ability to do that. And there's also related to that, a pretty uh, uh, um, robust line styles editor in Dorico as well that can attach 
uh, lines to different points, either on the rhythmic grid or to note heads above or below or inside the staff. And you can define the vector style for every piece of that along the way and save that as a thing that you can reuse in a lot of different places. There are um, uh, similar tools in other applications. I was just um, answering specifically with, with respect to Dorico, but I know Sibelius and Finale both have things that are along these lines too, right, Philip? Yes, that's right. And they all work in different ways. And probably that's something that we can get into more in the individual discussions of those applications. Because I am looking at the clock here and we've had such an amazing fun time that we are basically out of time already. Uh, and there is one last question that I'll just take very briefly. Uh, someone says that they don't have a mic, but they're just asking about importing house style programs like an OCR program that can look at a Baron Writer score or a Shermer score and then, you know, just then all automatically get the settings. That's a great idea, actually. I mean, that would be really cool. Like if you can scan the score and say that is that staff line thickness is whatever millimeters thick and the stem and all that, that would be cool, but not to my knowledge. And, you know, but it did give me another idea for the future is that, you know, maybe there is a way to kind of have a house style that one could make available that says this is the Henley style or whatever food for mm -hmm. thought. But anyway, I would say yeah. one, one problem you would run into with that is that the fonts that are used by a lot of those publishing houses are are not licensed for for your use, but of they course. are only licensed for the use of that that publisher. And yeah. so now something like this, like you're describing, Philip, maybe you figure out a way to do it with fonts that people are likely to have installed already on their computers. And that would be really I think that's a fun project now. Kind of yeah, like, or open source fonts. There are quite a lot or, of them that are very good now. Yeah. So look, we will definitely uh, explore all these. You've given us a lot of food for thought for future episodes of the podcast. And that's always exciting. We really appreciate uh, the interaction with co the community and to do it in this live format is really thrilling for us. We want to thank our sponsor, Newsic, for sponsoring the podcast and today's presentation. And we want to especially thank MOLA, an association of performance of... I'm sorry, it's a little new term for me. It used to be called the Major Orchestra Librarians Association, but now it is an association of music performance librarians, and I understand why it is. And we are so grateful to everyone, all of our wonderful, beautiful, special, terrific MOLA colleagues. I cannot think of enough superlatives to describe the feeling that I have for all of you uh, on the call and elsewhere, and especially Amy Tackett, for just the incredible work organizing this. I can't wait for all the sessions to come, Amy. Uh, it's just an incredible uh, buffet of, of offerings that you've given us to feast on. So thank you. Okay, well, I guess that will end our discussion for today. Uh, as always, it's uh, a joy to talk with you about this. Uh, David, this has been a lot of fun, don't you think? It has been a lot of fun. We should do this more. Yeah, and we will. Well, thanks to all of you on the presentation and to all of you listening on the podcast when it comes out. We will talk to you next time. Take care, everybody. So long.